Today, I'm honored to introduce one of the most influential people in fashion, Fern Malice. Fern is recognized as the creator of New York Fashion Week. And after two decades at the Council of Fashion Designers of America and IMG Fashion, she's currently host to the acclaimed 92nd Street Y interview series, Fashion Icons with Fern Malice. Welcome, Fern. Thank you, Mark. It was a pleasure to be here with you. It's so good to see you again. So you are, are responsible for giving me my start back in the day during Fashion Week. So now I want to hear how you got started. Now, I, I know you from the moment of Fashion Week, but how did you get to that point when you were executive director of C CFDA? Well, it's, how long is this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I've had a very, I've had a long and varied career. Uh, most people think I kind of was born and started at CFDA. In uh, right, movie. exactly. But um, I had a very, you know, successful career and was very, you know, established before I even got there. Um, I started my career um, by literally going to work with my dad every time I had a day off from school. Um, he was a salesman in the women's accessory business. And that started my love of the fashion industry, you know, going to work with him, going to lunch with him and his buyers and fashion directors of stores wow. and seeing that this is, looks like a good job for women. You know, they were going out to nice lunches. They were getting good presents. You know, they were uh, picking beautiful scarves and accessories to have in their stores. Um, so I always loved that. Um, and then Fast forward in college, I joined a competition for um, Mademoiselle Magazine, oh, you which did. at my time in college was the best, literally, yeah. best woman's magazine. It was a Condé Nast magazine, of, and it wasn't just fluffy fashion. It was, it was about writers and poetry and photography, and you know they published all the great writers of the time and, and launched many many careers. And I became a college board member for Mademoiselle, and then. I was selected in my senior year of college as one of the 20 guest editors, which was a very prestigious competition that yes. they had. Um, and I, rem I mean, I grew up watching the August issues and seeing the 20 people who were always mm -hmm. um, selected. And people before me were like Sylvia Plath, Joan Didion, Ali McGraw, Betsy Johnson. Wow. You know, so it's a, it was a great group of, um, to follow in their footsteps. Um, I, so I spent a month working with Mademoiselle with the other 19 guest editors and then left for Europe after that, after we helped put together the September, the August issue, which at that mm. time was a back to college issue. Oh, it was, now, okay. You know, department stores all had back to college departments where really? you back to school, you'd buy new clothes. Now you buy a new hoodie and you set. Right, right, you're done, right? Yeah, back to school clothes don't mean a thing to anybody. Right. And, um, Anyway, when I came back from my some, my prerequisite summer vacation in Europe, which is what everybody did in my generation after you graduated, um, my mom said that they were, Mademoiselle was calling me and I um, nice. I was the one of the 20 that was offered a job there. And I spent the next few years going to other college campuses all over the country, meeting guest editors and then doing, in fact, the merchandising department, which was the beginning of, I'd have to say my event um, experience. So I would be going to department stores all over the country, whether it was in Cleveland or Peoria or Honolulu, to do an event in the store to bring that issue or that message to life. So in some cities, we did events called On Location. We cleared out like an entire department in a department store, and everybody would sit on the floor, or if the store did it, they put up chairs. We'd set up a stage and have all the lights and, and we do makeovers. We'd send people to the restrooms to get their hair washed. And, <laughs> you know, we'd set up a little, little boutique on the stage and I would dress them and accessorize them and, you know, and talking the whole time and just communicating with an audience, but creating an event that was quite captivating. You know, I did one, I, I'll never forget one that I did for, um, it was a, the issue was about um, health and wellness and body fashions and and it was with the guru at that time of fitness, a man named Nick Karnofsky. You know, it was like one of those Russian gyms that people used to go to. Right. And he was a big man, a strong guy. And we were in the intimates department in the store, cleared out an area. And there was a slow runway 
set up for a, a mini fashion show that happened. And then there was a reporter interviewing him and saying to him, well, you don't, I mean, rudely saying, well, you don't look very fit. I mean, you're a big guy. I mean, how do you work at? And while he was talking to her, he just leaned over on this platform that was like six or 12 inches high on one arm and then lifted his whole body and ran and was parallel go. to the runway and took everybody's breath away and it shut that reporter up in a minute. <laughs> um, you know, so there were all sorts of interesting events like that. And then when I left uh, Mademoiselle, I, I, I did a lot of things. I worked in the garment district and wholesale and retail. I became also then the fashion director of Gimbel's East, which was a store up on 86th in right. Lexington. And that was a new store for Gimbel's. It was in the high rent district, not mm -hmm. down on Herald Square. And my job was working with all the buyers that was specifically hired for that store and creating boutiques. We, I was involved with the visuals, with the windows, with advertising. Um, we created small boutiques for like Calvin Klein and at that time, Diane von Furstenberg and people. And I was involved in what the paint choices were and what the furnishings oh, wow. were. And, you know, and the windows was my domain. And I hired people like Larry Laszlo and, and George Stavrinos to do ads, illustrations, displays. And, and we did little fashion shows. And that's what was my first introduction really to the market of going to see all these different designers and their showrooms and stuff. But then I left that um, when, when Gimbel's was bought by um, uh, Saks and stuff. And then um, I opened up a public relations company. Oh, she did that Fern, right after. Fern, it was called Fern Malice Public Relations. There might have been something in between there. I can't remember now. It's so long ago. But I would say to people, I think that I have 411 on my forehead. Now, if you say 411 today, kids don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I know my it daughter would to, wouldn't. It would have to say Google. Okay. You know? I mean, it was people would call me, where do you get this? I'm having a party. Where do I get? you know, shopping bags to put things in, you know, do you know a good caterer? Do you know with it? I mean, people always picking my brain for stuff. And I said, you know what? I could get paid for that information. Absolutely. You should. And so I started this company and I started with a couple of fashion clients being people like Selma Weiser, who owned a store called oh, Sheravari on the West side. That's where I worked. That's where I met my wife. Oh, well, and when I was there, Mark Jacobs was the stock mm -hmm. boy. He was. You know? Yep. And, uh, you know, and, and it was, again, come up with some ideas to bring customers in at five, six o'clock after work. It was the one small boutique on Broadway. Right, right up you know, the side. So started doing that kind of stuff, reaching out to wine companies and, you know, little mini events that, you know, did the trick. Mm -hmm. um, and then my clients really shifted to the industry all my friends were in, which was um, architecture and design. Um, my sister was an interior designer who then went back to Harvard to get a, her um, architecture degree. My two best friends were architects and interior designers. And when I started my business, I had a desk in their office. Um, so I was surrounded by their work. And at the time, talk about events, they were designing Studio 54. Oh, wow. So, you know, I was in this office where Steve and Ian were coming up for meetings wow. and it was a really heady time. That's so you much know, fun. And, and my first assistant, well, my second assistant, I guess, was a young woman named Jane Hertzmark, mm -hmm. who today is Jane Hertzmark Huddis and is the group global president of SD Lauder worldwide. I mean, wow. oversees almost like three quarters of their brands, mm -hmm. it's probably the biggest job in the cosmetic industry. Um, and she worked for me for six years. And, you know, and she still says when she talks to people, Fern taught me how to do this. Fern taught oh, me how to put the staples go. in the right way, how to do the margins this way and how to make things look a certain way. Yeah. And our clients were furniture companies, textile companies, rug companies, um, all the interior furnishings types of people. And we were doing uh, mark events at the trade shows to launch new products. So every one of those was an event. Like, what are we going to do? What kind of food should we have? What should, the, what should the theme be? What should the invitation look like? What are we giving out? You know, um, you know, and we were famous at that time for doing invites that had 
like glitter and confetti uh, early and ones. all those things at the beginning when mm -hmm. you loved it, but then people would hate you because it was all over their desk. <laughs> but, but they opened it, they remembered it. They remember. We always did things with colors and different sizes so that it stood out from your pile of mail. Mm -hmm. You know, all those things are part of the events. I miss those days. You know, yeah. even when I was at the magazine, you would send this great mailer and people remember. I mean, I, there was some cool stuff that we did at Condé Nast too. And now it's an email, you know, it's not yeah, it's the same. an email. There's no personality. There's yeah. no, you know, it's, 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 it's sad. I mean, cause that those touchy feely things really made a difference. And so I did that for, um, you know, I then had a, we had a client that was the International Design Center, the IDCNY yep. in Long Island City. Mm -hmm. And so th at that time, um, I was, they were a client and, and talk about creating an event. Um, this was a landmark event to launch this project was, which was a million square feet over the Queensboro Bridge in right. Long Island City. The kickoff launch party was the most glamorous black tie event at the Rainbow Room oh, wow. in New York. And it was on two floors. So there was one floor first where all the cocktails and everything was. And at a certain moment in time, and it was a cloudy night, which was perfect. You know, we asked everybody to go to the windows that faced east. So you were looking um, across the river and mm -hmm. over to Queens. Right. And we had sky trackers and things and all, whatever was set up in the building and we lit the buildings. Oh, beautiful. And people were like gasping. Right. Because you had power yeah. over the city. That's yeah. amazing. And, and then we did a, a dinner and it was, you know, I am pay and Guathme Siegel and all Mary Buada and all the decorators and designers of that time. Mm -hmm. And the dinner upstairs, I'll never forget. We worked with Rennie Reynolds, who was a great pal who did the flowers and they were round you know, big bowls with orchids inside with a light underneath it. So the whole thing glowed from the table and we, everything was dark so that that worked. And the, the Vignelli's Massimo and Leila Vignelli did a, a brochure that was black patent leather. It was one square <laughs> foot. It was 12 inches square and oh, it opened up huge. and all the pages of the event of the center were inside. And the first thing it said is, this is one square foot. There are 9,900 more at the design center, you know? And I mean, the graphics, every single element of that party was extraordinary. And then I closed my PR business to join them full time. And oh, the design was, center. Yeah. Cause we were oh. doing, I became VP of marketing advertising and we did so many events there for the design community you know, like constant openings of showrooms and, you know, themes, Italian design exhibitions, German design exhibits, you know, I mean, that's where I actually met uh, Bruce Ravid, who had Bruce and Bruce who right. was doing exhibits for us yeah. there. Um, you know, and that was uh, the best party spaces to do events in. Uh, I, it was really Kind of I, a fabulous heady time. I, I didn't even, I didn't even know you had this whole background interior design world yeah. i just thought it all like you said it i just knew it all as fashion but now it makes sense it all because connects. Yeah. it all connects because when we were doing fashion events in bryant park it really was interior design and that's why i loved working over there because you would let let's try this and let's try that and it was it was complete environment from that fountain and the different vignettes and now now i get it it all connects all connects you know, in long island city when we were doing parties you know we'd have you know a stack of extra invitations that were printed, you know, and I, with my staff, we would like cut it up, cut them, cut them, cut them. And then just, we'd sprinkle them on the floor and make confetti out of it. <laughs> you know, we used everything, you know, yeah, it was yeah. a, and, and it, that was also the same time that AIDS was happening mm, in, in yeah. a big way. And many, many of my friends died and were dying. And yeah. um, I became a founding board member of DIFA, yep. the Design Industry Foundation Fighting AIDS. And so we were, we were challenged as a community to come up with the cleverest events yep. to raise money because nobody wanted to talk about it. Nope. I mean, I if it was there before Amfar, before anybody, mm -hmm. you know, one yeah. of the proudest things is one of the first grants that Diffa ever gave was to Genghis, Gang, Genghis Stone, mm -hmm. who was the founder of God's Love We Deliver. And it was so that she could get a, a 
a restaurant quality refrigerator in the basement that she was working in to cook meals. Wow. You know, so we helped launch that in that way. And one of the events, and I did two two big events that were my events for DIFA. One was uh, the ultimate warehouse sale, which mm-hmm. was in a bi- in the one of the big buildings at the IDCNY, and every furniture company had a boot had an area, and furniture and rugs, everything was so. I mean, it was done, but like first class, first, right? You know, with perfect aprons that vine- that the Vignelli office designed that were, you know, with all the tools on them and um, everything was beautiful. And then I I did something called edible architecture. Mm -hmm. Remember that, yep. Um, And I got every architect and interior designer in New York to draw up a a building or three-dimensional look of something. And and long before there was a cake channel or a food channel or a cupcake business. Right, exactly. I researched and found every specialty food baker and cake baker and everything was turned into a three-dimensional cake or cookie. And then we put bo- you know, plexi boxes around them. They were on display for a week over Christmas at one of the interior showrooms. We filled up buckets of candy in every corner of the room. You know, you go, we used to go to those wholesale candy suppliers. Mm-hmm. Down in the East, East Village, yep. Yeah, yeah. and the yeah. nut suppliers where mm-hmm. you go and get volumes of that stuff. You know, and then everything was sold at auction at Sotheby's and it raised a little over half a million dollars, which was wow. a lot of money at that time. Yeah, that's a lot back then. Yeah, it's, yeah, that is a lot. So then now you went from there and then when did you start CFDA? Well, after the, at the IDCNY when I was there, we then hit, a, hit a, the brick wall of the recession. Hmm. It was the late, late 80s, mm-hmm. 90s, nine, in the 90s starting. And so they, you know, we were renting hundreds of thousands of square feet and then it stopped. Right. So I was let go, you know, which I always get crazy that creative people are let go before the, the idiot right. business. People, right. You right. Know? Cause right. You know, that's when they, sh- they would need us. I would think need us you the need us the most at that point. Exactly. So I left and, um, and I freelanced in um, loving and wine trip, Harriet wine trip and Mary yep. Loving's office. Mm-hmm. I shared an office space with Leslie Stevens. Okay. And I came with my triple Rolodex, triple roll Rolodex, which right. the same people who don't know 411 don't know what right, that right. is. Right, right. It's that, the round thing with all the cards. In. <laughs> yeah. I, it was a valuable tool. Excuse I think me. I still have it in my garage. Oh, you do? I think so. And, um, you know, and then um, I was working on events for them, you know, so they had Pantone was a client that mm-hmm. I worked with. Mm-hmm. created a color day at the Cooper Hewitt Museum okay. with seminars all day about color and advertising color and fashion color and this, you know, on the cocktail party at the end of the day, I had the caterer dye all the food different colors. Mm. So the cheeses were, cu- were pink and the <laughs> red was green and the, everything was, people were freaking out. Everything tasted fine. But, right. You know, it just looked a little off. The things <laughs> the colors, but it was so much fun. But while I was there, it was several, a couple of months, I was reading about the CFDA um, looking for, um, they had done their first seventh on sale event, Mm -hmm. which I went to, um, which was in the armory and was a legendary AIDS benefit that they finally pulled off. And um, at the end, and during that time, I kept reading Women's Wear Daily, which I read since high school, because my dad would bring it home, that they were looking... um, no, no, actually, the, that started after I was, I went to that event. Uh, it was in November of 1990. And I was blown away. I mean, the magnitude of it, I didn't go to the dinner because I couldn't afford that. I went to dessert. Robert Isabel, who was one of the, the florals, most extraordinary yep. event planners and designers, created the whole atmosphere in there with gauze from the high ceilings of the armory i remember that every designer booth for two hours you would get you would shop and then get online there were lines around the corner of the armory for for a whole weekend and they had like flowers suspended from the suspended from the ceiling i I remember one of the first events i've seen too and i was like the scale alone yeah was nothing i'd ever the fact that actually this was somebody's job to do that i think that's that was like this is, this is very cool. I can do this. I want to yeah. do this. How do, who does yeah. this and how? 
Exactly. So, I mean, I was blown away at that event. And when it was finished, they raised about $5 million. They, they, they literally lot. didn't know even how to distribute it. <clears throat> Carolyn Rome was the designer who was president. She resigned. Mm -hmm. They had an executive director who was a good friend of Perry Ellis's, and he didn't have his contract renewed. And the office, I mean, he actually worked in their office. And then the office that CFDA had was like, his, you know, it was like... Uh, it was like a big closet. It was in the back of the, <laughs> by the freight elevators in 1412 Broadway. And I was reading how they were now in search of a, of a, you know, a new director to mm -hmm. take them to a new place. Because at that point, unless you were a real, real, real insider, you had no idea what the CFDA was. Right. Was and more... actually, if, right. And for those who don't, who may be listening, who don't know at this point, it's the Council of Fashion Designers of America. And, and what, what is their ultimate, you could probably say it better, what is their mission? Their mission at that time was to further the goals of the fashion community and to treat fashion as an art, you know, to put it on the level of literature and dance. And, you know, and the organization was formed by the doyen of PR, um, um, Eleanor Lampert, mm -hmm. you know, and she went to Washington, D.C. and said the fashion industry should have a, a voice and they said create an organization and became you know a, a 501c3 and a 501c6 and you know so they um you know and they did they did some events they had what they were doing at that time was um their own fashion awards which they had taken over from the cody company well they did because prior to that cody did all the people won cody awards mm -hmm. uh, but then all of a sudden the designers started doing their own fragrances and working for different companies mm -hmm. and they said, why are we giving Cody any publicity on this? We should be doing our own awards. And they, they were small, beautiful events up at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And, and, and um, you know, if you were Babe Paley and um, Dita Blair and the New York Socialites, the Pet Buckleys, those are the people who went with the designers. Mm -hmm. You know, not like the Met Gala that we see right, today. Right. Um, talk about events. Right. And <laughs> so... That's um, how do I get off onto that? Oh, so CFDA and then CFDA, you then, so you got into C, so you I, then became executive so director. To, yeah. yeah. I said to the guys in the, in the PR office, maybe I should go up for that job, you know, cause I had organized the interior designers and architects and got them mm -hmm. together. I said, maybe I could do that for the fashion designers. I threw my hat in the ring. I was called like the minute my resume was received, nice. they had already narrowed down their search to five people that were finalists after seeing you know 30 or 40 and having seen you know 100 resumes and i came in and with my experience and my fashion background and everything i mean i was hired and um you know but in the first interview that i had um was with stan herman and mm -hmm. this designer monica tilly they were the search committee and I said to Stan, I said, I met you when I was a Mademoiselle guest editor. We went to visit you <laughs> and interview you. Because he goes, oh, yes, I remember that. I said, no, you don't. <laughs> That's OK, you know. But, you know, full, things come full circle in your life. They it's sure do. They sure do. You never know when people pop back in your life, just right. like you popping back into I, my life now. I've, I've always been around, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but that's so it's interesting. So when I started, you had just, I guess you must have had it you were like two to three years into CFDA. Well, when I start, I started in 91 in more end of March on my birthday. And it was, I took two weeks to get myself organized before I full, you know, moved over to take the job. And that's when they had market week, which, mm -hmm. you know, was fashion week essentially. And if there were 50 fashion shows, they were in 50 locations. Absolutely. Nobody talked to each other. Nobody cared if you were uptown, downtown. If you were in the Pierre ballroom one night and the next day somebody had a bar mitzvah, you had to take everything down. And if you rented it again, you'd put it all up again. Mm -hmm. um, but what happened is Michael Kors had a show on, in Chelsea in the West 20s. And as you know, the sound of the bass music, you know, though is very mm -hmm. loud. Mm -hmm. And if things aren't nailed down, they shake. Mm -hmm. And the, the ceiling shook and yeah. plaster came down all over the runway onto Cindy, Linda, Naomi, the supermodels who kept walking. Mm. 
And when the plaster landed in the laps of two of the most important journalists, You're like enough, they wrote, you know, we live for fashion. We don't want to die for it the next Absolutely. day. And that yeah. was my, my that, call. I said, I think my job description just changed. Right. You, you, have, I, you have to solve this one. So how did you come up with, and for those who don't know, I mean, Brian Park, bring it all together, one location, like what influenced you to do that? Well, you know, I knew that something had to be done and we had to figure out a place to do it and how can we make safe and sound places? Uh, because, you know, after Michael's ceiling collapsed, Isaac had a show down in a loft in Soho and the power blew. You know, there's a thousand people sitting in a venue, people are smoking with lights and no, no, no lights at eight mm. o'clock at night. You know, we had to wait for a backup generator to come because nobody was going to leave until they saw his show. You know, then, then Donna had a show and the elevators, the freight elevators broke at 557th Avenue. I remember Liz Tilberis from Harper's Bazaar had to be carried out by firemen halfway through a floor. <sighs> you know, there were just ridiculous things going on. So that became the mantra, organize, centralize, modernize. And um, first we did a couple of seasons at a hotel called the Macklow which is now the Millennium Hotel and Millennium Hotel. And, and then we negotiated with Stan, who was on the board of Bryant Park. You know, we looked at Bryant Park. It was like the backyard of the garment district of the right. fashion industry. And it was in the process of going through an incredible renovation. Right. It was, for those who don't know, it, it wasn't that pretty. It was late a 80s. druggy, rat scary park. Yeah. It's one of the most beautiful urban renewals anywhere, what they mm -hmm. did with Bryant Park. And we were able to make a deal. And we, I, I spent a couple of weeks dialing for dollars, you know, mm -hmm. calling companies and sponsors to raise the money, getting designers to agree to work together and share a, a similar venue right. and you know, personalize it to the degree that they could in the time mm -hmm. frame that we could rent it to them. Uh, you know, it went on and on. I mean, I could spend a whole hour on how we just did that. Oh, it was incredible. I, to, to it was a it was a moment in time. It's like when it, people say, like, "What was Studio Fifty Four like?" You had to be there, right? You, know, you, you it'll did. Never happen again. Brian right. Park will never happen again. Well, hopefully, maybe. Hopefully, yeah. I, I have hope. I, I, because I, I was working for Bruce Raven at the time too, building sets, and I want to be a designer. And they were like, "We want a designer that can build." And that's how I heard about it. They're like, "You're going to go to Market Week." And they're like, "Well, now there's a a different Market Week. We're all over here. You want to come?" I'm like, sure. You know how? To, what do I have to do? Um, you know, for me, I just I got my foot in the door through the through the house crew in the back uh -huh. picking up garbage. You did whatever you had to do. Right. I, I mean, just wanted to be around it. Work. When you say picking up garbage, one of my biggest mantras, you know, as an event organizer, I guess you'd call me in, in some respect. I mean, every season I would come in the tent and say, there's not enough garbage pails. Mm -hmm. I remember. Where are the garbage pails? You know, people are leaving crap around. Get mm -hmm. more garbage pails out. I would make sure that the signage was high enough and bold enough that you could and read I, it. And, see right, and I was right with you. I was like, you were I there. Need it. You heard yeah, me. You know, and, and it's not like we had a crew to help pick up garbage all day. People, you had to make it easy for them. And it, and it also had to look good. Uh, the look good was critical. Right. And you, I mean, and even just the, the general, which is what I, I miss so much. I mean, I miss that the tent fronts, we always use different artists and mm -hmm. graphics and it told a story and reflected the season or the messaging inside. It always changed mm -hmm. every season. It got, whether we had big birch trees or the place filled with um, hydrangeas in the mm -hmm. spring and many of which wound up in my garden. Oh, you I know, know, I mean, whatever it was, I mean, all the stuff and for Valentine's Day, you know, which we inevitably had shows on the information Everywhere. desk, mm -hmm. the buckets of either chocolate kisses or, or buckets of condoms to give out. I remember, you know, and I remember roses. filling up those. Yep. Yeah. And then in the fall, we'd, I'd make a deal with the apple growers and have mm -hmm. buckets of apples for people to take. You know, it was just those personal it made, touch of things. It made all the difference too. And I, I think you were even making this central area. And I think people still, at the time there were no, there was a hub. So that sponsor hub, people were like, well, fashion and sponsors don't go together. I'm like, well, somebody has to pay for this or help pay for it. And our job 
working with you was to make sure that the sponsors were integrated well, because if you let them be, it turns into a trade show. And at the end of the day, it was somewhat of a trade show, but it could never look that way. Right. You know, right. So and, and, and we reached out originally when I started at the sponsors who I knew had a vested interest in mm -hmm. the fashion industry being successful, going to Clairol, you know, as a brand, sure. going to prescriptives at the time, because Jane, who was my first assistant, was now at Estee Lauder, and that mm -hmm. was her brand. You know, going to Moe and Chandong because it's fashion that you have sure. to celebrate. You know, and the W Hotels, when, when we had those great lounges in the back. I, I mean, that backstage scene with W was spectacular. You know, and we made sure that, like you said, that every area, when Olympus was a sponsor, we created a whole place for all the photographers to hang yeah, out. You remember, you remember the wall we built where we had all the photos stuck all over the wall? And they mm -hmm. had it, it, it evolved through the week where we kept adding the, the pictures and pictures and pictures till it turned into a whole environment. I know. I wish I documented all of that uh, stuff when I didn't. I know it's yeah. in our head, but and I, I go back every to, season. It just, we did something else. Who had time to think about it? You just kept going on. Right. And in the middle, for those who didn't know, there's a, there's a fountain built into the, the park itself. So they would cover the, the whole park. And that fountain had to be turned into something every year. If it was a exhibit, I think one year we did a. The, At the it beginning, was the we did it with we did it for the red dress and the heart mm -hmm. truth. Yep. To raise money for the heart campaign, and we filled it with mannequins wearing red dresses, mm -hmm. and that each designer did, and then that evolved into a full-on fashion show of mm -hmm. red dresses. Yep. So we didn't have the mannequins in there, but we always had Laura Bush come as first lady yep. to inaugurate that event. But then you and I worked very closely on turning that into an accessory exhibition. Oh, yes. Yeah. Always creating accessory shows because the accessory designers felt like they were getting short shrift on the runway. Right. Yeah. And they and needed those to were some of the most fun exhibitions. You yeah, know? we we had you have these little items, you know, tall, small little items that you need to feel grand. So how do you create this environment that people want to go to and really check it out? Or they're waiting in line for the shows or something. So, I mean, I think this is incredible because now looking back, we were one of the building this hub or this world in the center. You know, now you look at the Academy Awards and all that. They have these great lounges and everything. It's like, but we we were the ones who kind of created this and kind of showed what could be done. It didn't need to be messy. And, you, and with your help, you kept it um, curated. I would always say when you were at CFD, it was curated. Outside of CFD, it kind of lost its thing. But it, it always needed a, a focal point as to what is the theme we're going to put into it, what is it going to look like, and then kind of protect how it would be cohesive. Yeah, what was the carpeting we would use to communicate? You know, all, all everything all it. about it all connected and made sense. Right, whatever that theme was not it, you know, we, I remember sitting in the meetings and the, the And tote themes. bags, we had huge bags with all the sponsored products. Mm -hmm. That was a big thing. Everybody would, the press would like line up for days waiting to get their bags. Right. I mean, you, know? I, you could, and you could sit in that lobby and people would, you just can watch people all day. You know, you would just every, and there were people who sat there all day. Yeah. Some we'd had like time to go, <laughs> time to yeah. go. We called them lobby fleas. Uh, right. I remember them. It's like uh, time to go. I know it's comfortable here and there's some companies, or I, I remember people sneaking to get in. That was the other thing, you know, using. Oh God. Yes. My, yeah. That, that was there were fun. people who snuck in telling security that they were me. Oh you yeah. Know, yeah. And, or and I had people saying, I had people saying, <laughs> you know, Ty and his guys would go, I don't think so. Right. <laughs> or I'd, I'd have people saying um, they worked with me. You know, they were, they were work, they're working for me and then they needed to help me. I'm like, I don't know who this person is. Or they worked for me two years ago. We, we uh -huh. don't, we're not working. It was so much fun to kind of, and I, I what I did, because I was working at Condé Nast at the time, and that's where I found my, you know, actually through there and then started working at Condé Nast. I would take my comeback every season to the shows to actually learn things because all the vendors, you know, all the lighting designers, the scenic had all these new ideas, all the creative. And I still work with a lot of them today, you know, BLT and Caden and all those people. And you know, they yep, still now, The people who worked in fashion were, uh, you know, it's not just the designer, you know, the designer is making their collection, but they're surrounded by so many creative people who take that vision and like you say, turn it into something the way the music is done, the way the mm -hmm. lights are done, the yep. way the cushion on the seat, the program, the whatever, you know, all of it is a creative 
journey that people do together. Right. You know, and and then it, that makes me crazy when people think to be in the fashion industry, you have to be the designer with your name on a label. No, it's, no you it's don't. A, it's a way, I think it's a way of thinking. You know, even today when we work, you know, I'll work with some of the vendors from fashion. I don't have to explain to them why I do what we do, why, why certain things have to be put a certain way. You know, some people are like, it's good enough. No, it's not. And those who have worked in fashion, worked with you um, throughout the years, understand it. It's just in your head. You uh -huh. understand it. It's, it's just, it's that fine. It's that extra step, almost like an artist. I was speaking with a, a scenic or a carpenter. They're artists. They're not just vendors nailing things together. They care. So yep, that's yep. important. So outside of fashion week, and I know we talked about a, various events and stuff. What would you say is your, one of your most favorite projects you've worked on? Well, I mean, I think, you know, some of the shows that I described from, you know, DIFA to, you know, the launch of the IDC and, um, you know, I mean, I'm proud of so many of those things. Right. I can't, you know, they're all so great, you know, and I, when I left after 20 years, basically, you know, after the tents shut down in Bryant Park and I said, you know what, that was my baby, you know, I'm, I'm over it now, you know, <laughs> we're moving, let somebody else take it on. And it was one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. And the time, it's all about timing. The industry hated the tents at Lincoln Center, even uh, though they were beautifully done venues. It was just didn't not work. the same, not the same. It, it, it the walk up there to get in there to walk yeah. through this place. And they, it, it, I mean, shoot me for saying this. I shouldn't, you know, but they had no soul. There was no, no, I, there, I understand. There was no energy and no pulse there, you know, I, no matter how hard people tried. I completely you know, understand. The front of the tents looked like you were going into a mausoleum or something. Mm -hmm. You know, so I left and took some time off and entered what I called in my first book, the coffee phase of my life, you know, with everybody calling me up and saying, can I take you out for a cup of coffee? I have an idea. Somebody told me I should talk to you. Can I meet you for a cup of coffee? Okay. I'd like to talk to you about a project. Can we have a cup of coffee? And I said, I had coffee coming out of my ears. Nobody was buying me lunch or dinner. They just wanted coffee. Um, but that experience led to a meeting with uh, a woman, Susan Engel, at the 92nd Street Y. Mm -hmm. And we started a program called Fashion Icons with Fern Malice. Um, I mean, out of nowhere, this evolved. You know, she said, you know, we'd love to do something with the fashion industry on an ongoing basis because it's such an important part of New York and the culture. And, you know, they'd had done interviews with designers up there. They were one-offs here and there. Mm -hmm. And she said, do you think you can do that? And I said, well, I'm usually the one being interviewed, but I could put together some good questions. And can you get some good people? I said, let's try. So it started with Norma Kamali, who was a dear friend. I remember, yeah. And then Calvin Klein, who, when I asked him on the stage in front of 900 people, I said, why are you here? You're not launching anything. You have no fragrance of product you sold your business 10 years ago and he said i'm doing it because you asked me well there you go and i said oh good answer <laughs> you know and then it was calvin it was donna it was tommy mark jacobs michael kors you know andre leon talley tom ford um uh polly mellon the editor um kenneth cole simon dunan bill cunningham right you know and so that series started as a me on the stage with mm -hmm. one of these fashion icons spending anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes sharing with the audience who they are and sure. how they became who they are and they were so and fascinating I, 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 fascinating interviews i'm really proud of them and i have to say this year we're celebrating our 10th anniversary it's, it's been, it's that been long. 10 years wow. of doing them i remember going to the I've first done, one i've done to 57 interviews wow. um the first 19, the ones I mentioned at the beginning, were in a book that came out in 2015 by Rizzoli called Fashion Lives, Fashion Icons with Fern Malice. Saks Fifth Avenue launched it with, again, a great event. Mm -hmm. We had the book featured in 13, in 14 windows, all the Saks windows for nine days nice. for a book, you know, and a party which had every designer and fashion mm -hmm. person there. Um, and then the book was reprinted several times. It was done in Japanese. It was. And I'm happy to say we now have volume two at the printer. 
and right. that's and we're creating a new very exciting boxed set of reprinting book one so book one and two you can buy together together and it's april is going to be another keep your eyes tuned for another great party at nordstrom all right i keep, i follow it i i saw the um the proofs on your social media i was like it's coming yeah, so it's, it's, coming. Like, it's very coming. exciting and, and, and the series keeps going i mean i this this fall after two year hiatus with COVID and everything mm. and theaters shut and what have you, I was exciting to be back. And I started with the younger crowd of Joseph Altazara and Prabhu Gurung. And next week, week after next, I'm doing Brandon Maxwell. And then we have some great people already lined up for 2022. Wow. And, um, and that's something I'm, I'm very proud of and excited about. Yeah, and if anybody, you know, you should definitely check out the the 92nd Street Y. Go to their web page. You can actually see the list. Y.org. Or go to my Instagram. Um, and what is your Instagram? Me. Just so it's people just, know. It's just at Fern Malice. There you go. And, so yeah, and, go to her Instagram. She'll she'll post when these 92nd Street Y talks are coming. They're extremely interesting. You get to a real, you know, behind the scenes look at fashion. Um, and you definitely would learn a lot for anybody starting out. And that gets me to my next question. If somebody's starting out in the business, let's just say, I'm going to say fashion is or design as a very broad industry. What advice would you give somebody starting out? So somebody come out of college. I'd say just, you know, check your ego or your attitude sure. outside the door. Just become a sponge. Listen and listen and absorb everything around you, um, you know, and, and offer to do anything, you mm -hmm. know, I, I mean, I, I've made coffee for a lot of people in my life and I've ran to coffee shops to get it for people. Even when I was running my business and I had clients, I'd, I'd make sure that every, everything was taken care of, mm -hmm. um, have eyes around your head. You know, I've had young, I've had student groups come to my office and my office, I have to say, has some fabulous articles framed, hanging up and all sorts of fun stuff. I've been, I've seen it. Yep. It's stuff. Fabulous fashion books and all sorts of things. It's a visual feast. Mm -hmm. And these kids come and, uh, you know, I won't even say from where these kids were when they came and, and I said, well, what can, you know, what do you want to know? What would you what would be most helpful for me to answer for you? Um, you know, so I don't just talk about my life and career, you know, I want to, and one girl raised her hand and she said, did you ever meet Presley Gerber? <laughs> and I thought, oh my God, Thanks. oh my God. And then, you know, and I told her yes. And then that I'd interviewed Cindy, his mother, mm -hmm. and, you know, and the whole thing, but, and not one of those kids even looked around the room and took in anything. Right. They, it was a blank slate. And I, when they walked out, I said to my assistant, I said, what a bunch of losers. Oh, no. you know, that was sad. <laughs> well, it, it is interesting because I, I think, you know, if you really want to get into fashion, the event world, you really do need to have your, it, like you were saying early on, it all comes around. You know, but you, you know what you absorb. really need to do? You need to go to events. I mean, even when I had my PR business and well, not when I was at IDC and why, no, CFDA, sorry. You know, and you, you knew the team there. There was an mm -hmm. office, a lot of young girls yeah. working and um, guys. And I would get a thousand invitations, you know, for everything. Yeah. And I couldn't go to, I say, who wants to go to this? You know, somebody, oh, I have a yoga class. Oh no, I'm going home. Oh, I have to go walk the dog. I'd say, you know, how do you know how you learn to be better in this business? You got to go and be out there and you got to see it. See what people are doing, see what they're doing wrong, see what they're doing right, learn from it. Right. And meet people, you know, and talk to people. That's mm -hmm. I, I I would make me crazy to be successful. You know, Lisa Sohanek, our buddy. Yeah. You know, she would say, are you she'd say these kids are crazy. She said, <laughs> I used to go to parties and walk in ferns wake and collect the business cards. Absolutely. You know, if they don't want they don't want to put themselves out to do anything. Well, I think some do. I mean some I some do, but I, but I'm shocked at how few you know, if if it were me, I'd say, I'm going, I'll uh, go. I, I I went to an event went the other day and I haven't been to one as a guest. 
in two years because of mm -hmm. COVID. I forgot how much I got out of it. Mm -hmm. Just visually, just what it was an actually an Alvin Ailey fundraiser oh, gala. Great. And it was just stimulating and inspiring. I mean, first the show and the live dance and then and then walking in, I actually knew some of the people working. I actually and I was talking to the producers and one of my friends who's a uh, he uh, produced the James Beard Award. We had a separate conversation. We're talking about lights. We're talking about fashion. We're talking about the music. We're watching everything just that absorbing doesn't happen it. sitting in your computer. It's not you. can't. And I was like, oh, we were just both of us were saying, I'm like, we have missed this. It really is a whole nother world. I know it's a, it, you know, it's like, uh, do I want to get up? I want to go, just go, just go and enjoy it, absorb it, meet people. And it'd be, yeah, a, I mean, I would so go much to out of it. three events in a night, you know, we are always can... out. Oh. <laughs> what well, well, they said, you're the most photographed uh, person in New York at one time, at one time, at one time. Well, Fern, this has been truly amazing. I, I, we can continue on for a long time on these conversations like you said everything comes around and you know people that have worked with you have just continued on also you've been a huge influence on so many people well thank you it's not it's always good to hear that yes so thank you and thank i appreciate you, Mark. it all and right you hang in there it's a pleasure to be with you you too thanks for listening to creating the perfect experience to get in touch and learn more, visit markstevenagency.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, let us know by leaving us a review or posting about us on social media. We love to see it. Until next time.